Yeah, good morning. My name is Courtney Betty. Uh, I'm a lawyer by background. Uh, practiced for 25 years. Headed up uh, international regulations for AT&T out of the states in about 16 countries, Caribbean, Latin America. Three years ago, I dedicated myself to helping the governor of Jamaica create a legal and regulatory framework for medical marijuana. And uh, part of that was on February 24th of 2015, Parliament in Jamaica passed the legislation and we're now working through the regulatory side. Simultaneously, I built a company, Timeless Herbal Care, and we're the number one company now in Jamaica in terms of the licensing process, having gone through uh, three stages of due diligence, uh, built out all of our infrastructure, and now waiting for the issuance of license. We're strongly believers in the international, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get a chance. Thank you, buddy. Uh, good morning, my name is Edgar Montero, and uh, first of all, um, two things. Uh, Randy, I think it's a little bit unfair uh, for me to be sitting here you know, with the tallest guys in the entire room <laughs> on my side, but uh, we, we, we will try to do this. And the second thing, yes, I'm from Latin America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and second thing is I'm from Latin America, specifically from Mexico. And uh, it happened that we started a project back in 2014 uh, with a friend of mine that is uh, sitting here uh, with the first uh, cannabis company in the entire Caribbean. Fast forward, uh, today we, we owned one of the largest uh, uh, growths in, in the Caribbean. Uh, we're, we are growing as we speak uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, we were able to uh, conduct several, several uh, meetings with the government. Uh, Mark right there was very helpful as well. And uh, I think we are uh, one of the most advanced uh, uh, policies in the world right now for cannabis and for investment. That's the most important thing for me. It's uh, make sure that the investors are taken care of. So. Uh, we will talk about that later, so. Uh, Lance Johnstone, uh, I was blessed enough to play 11 years in the NFL. Uh, once I retired, I went on to become a broker at Merle Lynch, uh, where I advised other players. Left Merle, start, went into the private investment uh, space, doing mostly angel investment. After that, uh, one of my clients who was uh, currently playing, uh, asked me to go look at uh, an investment opportunity in Jamaica. Uh, and I haven't turned back since I dropped everything. And uh, I think I'm Jamaican now, I'm not sure. I got to check, but I uh, was very uh, intrigued by the opportunity down there, uh, which we all get into later. Greetings and salutations in the name of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I. Ja. <laughs> it works a lot better in Jamaica. <laughs> My name is Barry Gainsburg. I'm a Rasta practicing. I've been an attorney in the United States. I'm admitted in New York and Florida. Babylon hates me and pretty much I hate Babylon too. So our work continues on. Basically, I've been in the securities industry as well, so I have a lot of experience with licensings, filings, enforcement actions, pretty much the same things that the CLA, which is called the Cannabis Licensing Authority, is going to be doing on behalf of the cannabis, uh, cannabis industry in Jamaica. So I hope in a little while to be able not only to give you information about the current state of rules and regulations there, and Courtney will do an excellent, excellent job on that, Really what I want to focus in on later when I speak are the business opportunities. How can you run a business in Jamaica? And this information won't only apply to Jamaica, but everywhere else is a black market. So I beg of you to please stay awake while I speak. Thank you. I'm going to get out of the little chair, so don't let it fool you. Um, <laughs> My name is Mark Slaw. I'm the CEO and founder of iComply, and iComply is a regulatory affairs company working out of Denver, Colorado. I think we're one of the oldest ones since about the year 2011. 
actually got started back in uh, university with Students for Sensible Drug Policy, looking at the disastrous policy of the drug war. And at heart, um, I'm here to end uh, international prohibition of drugs in general. And I think it starts with marijuana. I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, rulemaking groups in Colorado throughout the years, legislation, and to be really on the leading edge of running industry associations out of uh, Denver and out of Colorado Springs, the two largest cities in Colorado, where arguably a lot of the policies and regulations and best practices have been set uh, forward. About a year ago, I was fortunate enough to start working with the Puerto Rican government. I uh, went down there and looked at their 42 pages of what they called regulation, where patients would have been uh, locked inside their homes and had to use marijuana in their own home away from their kid or they would have faced felony charges. Um, there's that stigma that really is real. I'm also dual citizen with Brazil and the U.S. My mom is from there, so I speak uh, better Portuguese than I do Spanish, but uh, Edgar puts up with my Portunol, uh, which is a mix of Portuguese and Spanish. Um, exactly, kind of like Spanglish. And I'm just uh, really happy to be part of this, um, this particular movement. I was contracted by the government to develop the regulations. We never had any laws uh, because they were all set down through uh, executive order by the old governorship. And now politically we're moving through a new governorship and uh, also a new presidency. So it should be pretty interesting on in the, the island of Puerto Rico given that it's a territory. Oh, you got it? Okay, cool. I watch the feedback. I want to start down at this end again with uh, Courtney. And Courtney, could you tell us a little bit about what you perceive as Jamaica's plans to legalize and where they want to go as a country in with cannabis? I know Barry's going to speak a little bit uh, on the specifics. Essentially, Jamaica has three categories. There's one for religious, the Rastafarian community, they're able to use it for religious purposes. Uh, two ounces if you're... Uh, caught with possession of two ounces, there's no issue. And then there's a specific framework for uh, the commercial aspect, the medical aspect of it, allowing tourists to be able to access uh, um, what they describe as medical marijuana, with the exception that the law uses the word therapeutic. Um, and makes it a lot easier for people to be able to get that access. So Jamaica's putting that framework in place right now. Um, Critical though in Jamaica, I think Jamaica's an opportunity, if you look in the previous discussion talked a little bit about canopy and tweed. It's kind of interesting, canopy and tweed success in my view is not about them being a, a tremendous Canadian company. They're one of the leaders internationally right now. Uh, they see the vision uh, of what it's gonna be for this industry, which is gonna be an international industry. Um, their stock rose by 20% yesterday. I think it's going up by another 20% today based on announcements that they're making with Germany and other countries. Uh, we see Jamaica as potentially a supplier to companies such as Tweed and other international companies because of the low cost of growing and all the other um, import-export. There is a legal framework in Jamaica right now, similar to Canada, similar to the Netherlands, that does allow for the export of medical marijuana products, and I think that potentially could be Jamaica's advantage. Edgar, so let's take that question to Puerto Rico. Where do you see the Puerto Rico market going and what are the advantages of doing business in Puerto Rico? Well, Randy, there's, uh, there's a lot of advantages. First of all, uh, we're talking about an island that receives uh, two million uh, people just for tourism every year. Uh, most of them are American. And the most amazing thing of all is, even though that it's the Caribbean, you, you trade in dollars, which means that for investors, that is one of the most secure places. If you talk, if you talk about uh, uh, a framework in which your investment can succeed, I don't believe America has another structure than Puerto Rico. There's three different aspects of it, and it, this is more for, for the entrepreneurial uh, uh, audience. And it's called Act 20, Act 22, and Law 185. Uh, basically, you have a, a federal tax bracket of only 4%. Uh, personal gains, it's, uh, uh, it's 0% on capital gains, 0% uh, on dividends. So it's very, very enticing for people like that. Um, well, with the law 185, there, and we can talk about that a little later, uh, it's for investment funds. 
So people, uh, the regulations there allow investors and allow companies to grow. Uh, we're talking about licenses that goes 50,000 square feet, 60,000 square feet, 100,000 square feet. Uh, I don't believe there is another one bigger than that, but that we can discuss that later. Uh, and uh, the interesting factor about that is, uh, is that this grows, and if you are in the cannabis industry, you know that we need investments. And those investments uh, are called by, not by the hundred, but by the millions. And when you got into those type of investors, you need security, you need a safety net. And, uh, and Puerto Rico provides that safety net. Obviously, there's also a stigma in the, uh, in the media that Puerto Rico has been uh, filed bankrupt, and there's a lot of different issues in, in Puerto Rico. And I don't want to see that as a, as a challenge, but more like an opportunity. Um, just, uh, just very recently, you can buy a home for probably 40 cents on the dollar, which means that uh, it's ridiculously uh, low. And the profits of your business can make up for any issue or challenge that Puerto Rico may have. So my, uh, my vision of Puerto Rico, it's, it's going to be a heaven for this industry. And uh, well, we, can, we can discuss that a little, a little bit okay. more later. So I'm going to go from a different tack with Lance, and the reason I wanted him up here is he's actually, he talks a little bit about investing. He's part of a professional investment group. He's part of Star Angels. He's part of uh, IBR Ventures. Um, I think he's been through more executive programs than anybody in the country. I think you went through, am I right, Harvard, Wharton, Harvard. and Stanford? Most people only need one of those. I'm still trying to figure out why he had to go to all three of those. The NFL was paying for it. I took it. Oh, <laughs> good for you. So he does know what he's doing with investing. Yeah. This is not somebody that is made a few million dollars playing football and then was trying to figure out where to put his money. He manages money for other, not only athletes, but other professionals. He's gone to school. He's a professional at it. So my question to you, Lance, is your first uh, investment of your own, really, in the industry was with Courtney in Jamaica. Why did you see that opportunity for you as an investor and jump in there? Uh, basically, uh, it provided the safety. It's amazing how uh, the, so much has changed in the last year. It was only a year ago that I was there. And it, you know the US has even grown a, a lot in that last year. But during that time, I thought because it was so much gray area here in the States. Um, and then for my client base, there's, um, you know, an even higher kind of bar to kind of clear to stay, you know, um, completely clean. But then you still had a lot of guys that wanted to get in the industry. So the Jamaican opportunity gave us, our, you know, gave us a way to invest into um, an opportunity where there was federal laws in place. You know, we weren't dealing from, you know, one law in this state, another law in this state, worrying about what the feds are going to do. Um, you know, it gave us that safe haven. Uh, and then, you know, outside of that, we looked at just where the market would go in the future. We talk about them having a legal framework to export. Um, that was a big deal. Uh, so that was basically it. It was uh, the, the, the main driver, you know, a lot of my guys really were um, anxious to get into business, saw where it was going, but were terrified of what the feds was going to do and then trying to figure out, you know, state to state. And a few of the guys are still playing. So they don't, you know, some, you know more people are sensitive about, um, you know, who knows that they're in the business. So that gave us, you know, it's also an opportunity, you know, you could be on the books down there and, you know, no one up here would know it. Um, and then also uh, we feel as the, the industry grows, the plant itself is going to become more of a commodity um, going forward. So you're going to be looking, you're going to always have a, a, a price battle. So we thought with uh, not only Jamaica's built-in brand in this industry, um, but also the way, you know, they're structured, uh, 
I don't, I don't know if any other place with that strong of a brand um, will also be able to beat how low Jamaica could keep their costs because they're not forcing anybody to grow indoors. Um, so you're talking about seeds in the ground and perfect climate year round. So taking in all those different uh, factors, we thought that was the first uh, place to kind of launch off at and then, you know, keep following what's going on here in the States and take advantage of opportunities as they arise in that way. Yeah, there was one other thing. I did do some homework. Courtney actually helped educate me a lot about importing and exporting because I wasn't a big believer in it. Uh, and thank you for that, Courtney. But Lance, there was also uh, in Jamaica uh, with Timeless, you guys have some sort of research agreement, if I remember right. Can you kind of expand a little bit upon that? Because I think that that's a big, big uh, opportunity that plays for people who would want to maybe invest in you or invest alongside you or invest in others, but if you could just expand upon your research. Well, that was really important for us and a key part of our decision right from the start. We signed an agreement with the University of the West Indies, one of the leading research organizations, not just in the Caribbean, but they recognize international. Because we made a decision three years ago that we were really going to be a true nutraceutical, aiming to be a pharmaceutical company. So our, our approach was never about smoking ganja. It was really about looking at what are the true health and wellness benefits that could come from this plant. And so we have uh, both the University of Technology and the University of the West Indies. The first investment I made down there was to actually bring the top scientist in the Caribbean, Dr. Lawrence Williams. He's part of our team. We now started a research institution at the University of Technology that he heads up. We're really keen on looking at the opiate situation and uh, pain relief when we've got products in that direction. So for us, it was a perfect fit to be able to do that. It would be a huge challenge financially to carry out these kind of research in the United States and in Canada, and we're getting that done in Jamaica. Okay, and now I'm gonna go to Barry, and Barry came to me a different way, and he is Rastafarian, and so I'd like you to take a look at that from not only the religious standpoint, but the industry there and how you see that as, as playing in, in our industry. I mean, we have all know about smoking ganja, right? And, and getting some good stuff from Jamaica every so often, but it might be a lot more often now, guys. Don't take it home with you. Okay. Um, here's, here's what I can tell you. When I say Jamaica to you, what do you think of? Raise your hand. What are the three things you think of? Somebody raise your hand. I'm gonna take this guy in the front. Paradise is good. What's two? When I say Jamaica, what do you Bob think Marley. of? Bob Marley's great. What do you think of back there? Perfect. Those were the three answers I wanted. Three answers I wanted, right? So Jamaica should be the Jerusalem of ganja as it is to the spiritual faiths. This is where it's been nurtured. This is where the fight has gone on by my community for years and years. People have been imprisoned, stigmatized, and killed for having a spliff in their mouth. That's oppression. It should not happen, nor is it going to happen anymore. Rasta has been recognized by the Jamaican government to have the ability to grow ganja, to possess ganja, to smoke ganja, to have possession of ganja, to gift ganja. What Rasta cannot do is sell, sell ganja to you. So, there are different ways for Rasta to do this, and this is what I help them with. If you have a beverage that is filled with cannabis and is medical and ganja, you can't sell the beverage, but what I can sell is a cup, and I can gift you the drink. There are ways to work the line. You just got to think. So, anyone who's a Rasta for the most part will have to get a license through the CLA to sell commercially. But this brings up a great point. When I land in Jamaica, I get offered ganja. When I go to get my rental car, I am offered ganja. When I go to pick up my rental car, I am offered ganja. When I get to my hotel and check in, help me out people, what am I offered? Ganja. Right. When the person brings me up to my room, what am I offered? Right. When I walk down on the street outside of my hotel, many people offer me 
and some other things. But yes, ganja. Okay. So I've been hit five or six times because these people have bud. And if I want bud, not medical, recreational bud, I'm not going to somebody's legal store. Just remember, like with the stock industry in the United States or the ganja industry in Jamaica, just because you run a compliant business means the government will not shut you down. But if you don't have a business plan, I sell ganja. Well, that's great. But how are you going to do it? What are you going to do? How are you going to finance it? That'll put you out of business. So you got to worry about the government, and then you have to worry about market forces. So what can I do? And this is in the United States, too, because you're not in Jamaica. Recreational is decriminalized, meaning it is a $500 Jamaican ticket. I will tell you what that means in U.S. dollars. If you have $5 on you, you are good to smoke, right? And in fact, no cop will ever write you a ticket because the government doesn't have money, so they haven't printed up any ticket books. So when you walk by a cop, feel free to share with him because there's not much he can do about it. Bless you, Babylon, right? So here's my point. I cannot compete with Bud. Bud is a commodity. But what I can do is have a different product. I can have vape. I can have the oils. I can have the edibles. Nobody offered me any of that on my five or six touches from the airport to the hotel room. That will get me out of my room to go to one of the stores. So what do I need? I need a unique product. And maybe even if I don't have a unique product, what else do I need? If I had a beach, can't put that right in front of the hotel unless you're staying on the beach. If you have a waterfall, if you have a mountaintop with a beautiful panoramic scene around you, you cannot replicate that on the street. So here is my word to you, not only in Jamaica, but again, the cops are never going to get rid of the people selling it on the street. That's not the purpose of this exercise, right? They're not going to make a real big living doing that anyhow. It is the people who invest, who have business plans, who have financing that are going to succeed. You need to have a plan. Just because you smoke it, like it, know other people have made money from it, does not make you a gondrepreneur. It makes you hopeful. It makes you a wannabe gondrepreneur. But you got to get your stuff in order first. And the next piece I'm going to tell you is when you do this, make sure you have people you can trust. Jamaica is a difficult place to get business done. It takes a long time to get a corporation incorporated. I have asked for a work visa. They have not given me a work visa because of my criminal past, except for one little tiny detail. Guess what I don't have? I mean, I'm a lawyer, and I deal with criminals all the time, lawyers, judges, but I'm not, per se, a criminal. So go figure that one out. But I didn't staple some bills to my application. A lot of corruption in Jamaica. Not only is it underneath the surface, but the hands are right out there in front of you. So you got to be careful with who you're dealing with. And you need to be careful with the people you deal with on the ground. You need people like Courtney. You need people like Lance. You need people that have the best interests of the industry at heart, as opposed to basically those who see you as an ATM. So these facts, regardless of it being Jamaica or anywhere else, you should always keep in mind. I hope these things that I have explained, that I will explain more to you if you like, have made some sense and will get your brain thinking and have left a sign on the temples of your mind and your heart. And I wish you job blessings in your pursuits. Thank you. <clears throat> We're gonna, Mark, I'm going to ask you a different question just to uh, catch everybody up a little bit. Everybody from this panel and everybody that's been speaking will be in the networking arena for lunch and during the day. Feel free to, you know, well, don't grab them too hard, but grab them if you need to. Talk to them, ask them questions one-on-one. -on -one. We try to create a more, an atmosphere of networking here where you can actually get to the people, and that's a big part of what we want to do. Mark, I'm going to ask you a totally different question because as all this has come out, uh, and, and I heard somebody earlier talk about investing in Canada and why it's so much better, I totally disagree. Uh, the SEC has ruled here in the United States that you can invest in any public company that is touching the plant, and that was done with TerraTech to start with, and there's more that are out there. 
that you can invest as long as they're investing in a legal business. And Mark, that's a big part of what you're helping people understand is the compliance, what it takes to be a legal business, whether it's in Puerto Rico, whether it's in Colorado. Can you talk a little bit about what it really takes to be a legal business in those states and how you make sure that you're legal and how as an investor, they can come back and check to make sure they're investing in somebody that's operating legally. Uh, and if you're willing to invest in somebody that's not legal, I do have a still in my backyard um, and a few other things back there as well. But Mark, if you'll kind of talk about how can they protect themselves if yeah. they're investors in what they're well, investing in. Well, this is a really relevant question, Randy, especially in light of California's recent legalization. And um, I don't think Canada is going to be the largest state alone Canada and has for a long time, uh, just frankly put. So it, I was in Oakland uh, that night, and, and I'm already getting a lot of calls from California, and then Florida seems to be the other really big one on people's radar. And the reality is um, there's, there's sort of a reality to this business, that first and foremost, it's a very political business. First, you are uh, in, the rule, in the business of writing legislation, regulations, and dealing with politicians for the most part. Secondly, it's where those rules hit the road, that you are in a compliance business, secondly. And thirdly, you get to grow and sell marijuana. And it's kind of that order of operations that you should be thinking about when, when you're approaching these new markets. So the reality is we're all um, looking to be in this business, and if you're in the U.S., you are technically operating in violation of federal law. And we are the coolest legal federal criminals that I've ever met in my life. But we are all federal criminals up here, right? That's just a reality because all we're operating on is a Department of Justice guidance memo. So even the pivoting by groups like National Cannabis Industry Association, sit on the Minority Business Council with them, they're my next door neighbors, everybody with the Trump election is sort of reacting and going, well, wait a minute, what does it mean to be in compliance with DOJ guidance? If the DOJ, I don't know, appoints Chris Christie as the Attorney General. Yeah, that's a problem. So, so we have some priorities that are shifting. I think if we look at it, the genie's out of the bottle. The reality is that 80% plus Americans agree with medical cannabis, and we just won eight out of nine states on election day, four of which just went forward with full out legalization, and that is huge, and we should be celebrating, even if we are uncertain about that future, because the American people have spoken. So politically, first and foremost. Secondly, we're seeing this area of compliance, and there are a lot of standards that are coming into place in these businesses, regardless of the particular market you're in. In Puerto Rico, we took those 42 pages of regulation and turned them into nearly 200 pages of well-thought-out, well-designed regulation because we had to take into account the political reality. And the political reality is we were changing from essentially Democrats to Republicans again. If I'm going to use a very broad context because the nuance of Puerto Rico with no national sports, they say that politics is the national sport out there. And the reality is we've changed that entire regime. And so there's a, a sort of two policy objectives we had. One was to make sure that we had built a robust regulatory model in which people would be in clear, unambiguous compliance with the law, that there would be minimized risks to, to public safety, that product would be safe, it would be tested, wouldn't be contaminated, it would be secure, that we wouldn't have dudes in AK-47s rolling up on grows and being able to take uh, product at will. So these are big considerations. And then secondly, to make sure that the people who were sort of walking into a very heavily regulated environment could make their money back. Because in heavy regulations, you're outlaying a lot of expense to be able to comply with those rules. I mean, in, in Colorado, we literally have more pages of rules and regulations for cannabis than we do for oil and gas. So it is easier, conceivably, to blow up dynamite in the ground and frack oil than it is to extract oil from a plant and sell it. Um, and that's kind of the reality under a federal uh, regime that we're, that we're dealing with. So in Puerto Rico, we wanted juggernauts to be able to carry this forward, people with large-scale investments. And as, as you pointed out, Edgar, Puerto Rico is very favorable to investors. They will cut your taxes all day long. Pharmaceutical industry enjoyed that for many, many years. And then they started taxing the pharmaceutical industry, and they left. So guess which facilities we get to build out in? <laughs> awesome pharmaceutical facilities that are sometimes 100,000 square feet where they used to uh, be manufacturing a variety of different drugs, and now they're just empty shells that are perfect with RO systems built in, with clean rooms and antibacterial walls, uh, security, the gates, the walls, everything else you need to be able to uh, cultivate, distribute, manufacture your products, self-test. 
So there's a lot of, of, of opportunity, I think, in, in the Puerto Rico market. And so in this political environment, we've created a very heavily regulated environment, one in which there were tall barriers to entry. But one thing we didn't want to do was completely throw this bone away either. So something that's very important, especially in communities that are impacted by the war on drugs, is to ensure that the wealth this time stayed within the, the island of Puerto Rico. So at least 51% of the equity on these businesses has to be Puerto Rican owned. But that allows up to 49% for outside investment to come in and own these companies as well. So we really wanted to see wealth generated. Because of the economic conditions of Puerto Rico right now, $80 billion in government debt, we want to make sure this cash cow can grow and that people get to benefit from it on the island, that there's new jobs being spurred. So we allowed for a three-tier model. We allowed for people to come in, and we allowed for outside investment to put their money in Puerto Rico to allow for that Puerto Rican job creation and for the economy to get a nice jolt uh, and jump start. And indeed, it has, I believe. Uh, about $200 million at least has been brought in in the first round of just cultivation applications. And it's been a challenge politically too because we had to uh, try to get these plants out as soon as possible. And um, we did go from July to licensing in September. And I think for the first time we, we got innovative and we said you're not going to start with seeds and clones. You can start with fully flowered plants. As long as you put them into your tracking system and they test out with no contamination and you can test the potency. So we've taken probably the four largest black market growers in Puerto Rico, converted them into the legitimate marketplace, and now the prices on the black market, which is a totally different uh, policy objective than what Jamaica maybe is trying to do, but the, the prices on the black market have gone from 250 an ounce to 450 an ounce, and all of the black market product that was there has now been converted into legitimate market. So it's been a really interesting environment to get to work in, but it has a lot to do with the politics and the policies, and Latin American politics and Caribbean politics are a whole nother kind of ball game to, uh, to maybe what we deal with back here in the States. Um, but it is also important, secondly, to then make sure your applications are extremely well designed, that then you can actually take forward and implement that compliance and those robust uh, control mechanisms and business infrastructure that you need to be able to show clear, unambiguous compliance with those laws so that you aren't running afoul of it, losing your investment, or um, giving anybody any reason socially uh, to come back and, and blow back against your business. And that's sort of the next step to be seen, uh, especially in places like Puerto Rico and Latin America, is what is that social blowback going to look like? Um, and I think there's some, some things we can do, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about it privately, uh, in terms of, of government-sponsored messaging, ways of being able to educate and sort of uh, overcome those stigmatizations. But I think as soon as that first patient starts buying cannabis, we all get to witness this really powerful miracle where people get better, and they get relief, and they get off of their pharmaceuticals. And it's that magic that, um, that I think provides hope for, for all of us and why we're starting to see um, so many people really shift to the side and vote in favor of, of medical and even recreational cannabis. So there, there's another thing, Randy. Um, let, me, let me step Good. in. Randy? Let, let, let me step in for a little bit. Uh, I think it, it's, safe to, it's safe to say that uh, I, can, I can speak for my, uh, my fellow Latin American uh, people, because I'm Latin America, and yes, indeed, there's a lot of corruption there. Uh, and uh, when I started uh, in Puerto Rico, that was one of my fears, because even though that we are structured in a way that we are part of uh, uh, the United States, still some regulation and still some agencies that are not very uh, aligned, let's put it that way. Uh, and. Uh, it's not different than Mexico, for instance, and, and there is no different from Colombia. I've been doing business in those countries before, and I know how hard it is for someone that, that comes uh, and try to invest to have those type of uh, safety nets that we talk about uh, a little later ago. Uh, it's, for me, this is, this is the, the, the three things that, that you guys, investors, uh, need, to, need to focus on if you are going to the Latin American market. First, is a regulatory uh, framework strong enough to hold your investment? Because at the end of the day, we are not talking about uh, uh, the greatness of the industry per se, but you're talking about your, your hard-earned money. So uh, make sure that the regulatory framework is good. 
Uh, second of, uh, secondly, I strongly suggest you to have a, uh, some wonder. Uh, there, uh, the word loving in, in, in Latin America is not necessarily uh, a great topic, but you need to find something, someone that you can rely on because it is not easy. Uh, but once again, uh, you have an advantage, and I don't know if you realize or not, you are years or ages uh, uh, above the, anybody else's knowledge in, in, in America. Do you have the example of Colorado? Do you have the example of uh, Washington, Puerto Rico? Do you have many, many, many uh, cases of study that you can learn from it, and there is available to you. So with that knowledge, you can go to any part of Latin America and try to make uh, a business out of it. And I can uh, trust me on this one. Latin America is known to be warmed for the people that come to invest. You need to be careful. I'm not saying you go tomorrow to Mexico and try to invest in it or go to uh, uh, Brazil or go to any other part of, the, of Latin America and, and spend your dollars. Uh, but I can tell you that if you do it in the, in the right way, with the right team, it's going to be a blast. And, uh, I'm going to let Courtney go, but be, be, so that everybody's aware for questions and everything, I actually have two tables reserved in there, one for Puerto Rico, one for Jamaica for lunch. They're tables of 12, and that way people that are interested in investing and finding out more can meet with you guys. So I just want to let you know that because I want to make sure I'm very interested in this. I think a lot of people are. So I want to make sure that you all realize that you're going to be able to continue this conversation with everybody up here uh, during the lunch hour. Um, there's been a lot of talk about investing, a lot of talk about corruption, all the challenges. And that's reality. I mean, it's reality anywhere you go in the world. Um, I don't think, you know, in some countries it may be a little bit difficult, more difficult. There is something I believe that is more valuable than cash. And so we've built our company on that, and that's intellectual property. Many of you are already in this business. You're already doing various things. Um, Christopher is here. Christopher, stand up, please. Christopher is amazing. He's been working with the Native American Reserves for about seven years. He's developed 16 different formulations. Um, for different diseases, those are very valuable. You're not getting an opportunity to have those in terms of intellectually protected, the proper research done, production, in a, in a friendly environment. And to me, that's what Jamaica right now presents, and I'm certain other countries as well are looking at that. I mean, you know, it's, do you, you know, we partnered with Open Vape because we felt that on the vaporizing side, they were there in terms of the intellectual property, all of those, and we're looking and partnering with companies where they're bringing their intellectual property. We would rather take your intellectual property than cash, because two or three or four years down the road, the value of that, GW Pharmaceuticals, they're the biggest company, not because of all the great products they have, because the amount of patents that they own. So I want to leave it, because we got to start thinking in this industry in a real business manner and remove ourselves from this, you know, this kind of concept of all the different barriers. Because if we don't position ourselves in that thought process, thinking what's gonna happen two or three years down the road, we're all gonna be looking back and said, wow, I could have been part of this fantastic industry. Hi, I just wanna add one thing We've discussed what the requirements are in Puerto Rico for foreign investment. As the interim rules in Jamaica stand at the moment, you have to be a resident for three years. They are not looking, because of its past history, under colonialism, of being exploited. So they don't want to see, and Jamaica's correct in this, the capital from Ganja coming from the island, leaving the island. They want to keep that natural resource because it's the last natural resource really Jamaica has. If anyone's interested, you can read about bauxite and how that played out on the island. So, if it is an individual, 
needs to be a three-year resident. You can do a collective, which is fine, called friendly societies. The second part is you can have a company. However, that company, and you can take on foreign, foreign investment, but that company must be substantially owned by a local resident. I know what majority means, right? 50.0001. I do not know, nor has the CLA defined what substantial is. Does substantial mean there's only 30% for foreign investment? Is there 35% for foreign investment? Is there 25% for foreign investment? And there are ways around that to get you repaid as well, if you think. But the problem really is this. When it comes to markets and money, the one thing people hate to do with their money is place it in a situation where there's uncertainty. And until there is certainty of rules, I would tell you to keep your money safe when you know what the rules are. And that doesn't mean to plan for a business and the rest of it, but unless you know the, game, the rules of the game, unless you know the baseball game you're playing has three strikes and four balls and not two strikes and eight balls, you don't know what you're going to do when you're standing up there in the batter's box. So you got to be real careful that you understand the rules of whatever jurisdiction or territory you're going into. Because if you're playing baseball and they're playing cricket, you're going to be at a major disadvantage.